journey of mountain exploration and self-discovery. Many people have asked me, uh, why mountains? Why do you go and risk your life in the most unhospitable and remote places on the planet? Why do you even break up with your girlfriend just to go on these bloody expeditions? <laughs> and I mean, just like uh, some facts about mountains, did you know that mountains provide more than 75% of our supply of fresh water? One fifth of the world population live, lives in the mountains. Mountains are very important for our society. I had a more personal um, affair with mountains. Uh, the first time I went to the mountains, I was nine, nine years old. And this was due to my mother, who was uh, both a skier and an experienced trekker. And she took me to Retezal National Park in, uh, in the Carpathians. And I wanted to surprise her. And I wanted to surprise all her friends and be beyond expectation. So while we were climbing this steep slope, I went a bit off path, and I've speed up the pace. But well, that turned out to be a really bad idea because soon after I've slipped, I rolled over and hit a boulder. And I kind of crouched down and when I finally opened my eyes and looked around and I saw these jagged peaks around me and the steepness of the slope, I completely freaked out. I was so scared and even though my mother tried to calm me down and explain me that it's fine, you know, just open your eyes, just breathe, it, it didn't work very well. And moreover, um, the, the, the clouds starting to cover the skies and soon a thunderstorm with rain and hail began. And I was, I was really terrified, but I looked down and I kind of crouched down and I saw this pattern uh, in, in the rocks of cracks and I thought to myself that if I use them as uh, handholds and footholds, I might be able to advance. If I pull myself with my hands and push them with my feet, I will be able to reach the ridge. And I started doing that and slowly, gradually, I've started to focus more of my attention on these cracks. And eventually, I've actually reached the summit in, in, in just a couple of minutes. And I was still kind of crying. I mean, I was nine years old, and I was crying all the time. And, uh, but when I reached the ridge, I was in awe. I was absolutely amazed that I've managed to dissolve my fear and discover that if I focus my attention on something, I'll be, I, I, can able, I, I will be able to reach a great goal. So I realized that mountains are great teachers. If you initially feel unequal to do a climb, and I wanted to think of mountains as a challenge, the mountains will provide you um, the knowledge that you need to reach the summit. So that was a great discovery for, for, for a nine-year-old guy. And um, I started to explore mountains more extensively. And I've joined some uh, local mountaineering club in, in Transylvania. And um, I've learned skills in rock climbing and alpine climbing and ice climbing. And I've met like-minded people. And soon, I've joined an expedition to the Alps. We, we wanted to climb uh, uh, the Matterhorn in Mont Blanc. I was 17. At this, at this point. And um, our first attempt on the Matterhorn was unsuccessful because of bad weather. So we waited three, four days in, in the hut in Cara on the Italian side. And um, we, we thought, OK, it should be, if, if we wait uh, and we hydrate and we acclimatize properly, we, we will try again. Three, three members of our team decided to go home because, uh, well, they had to go back to work and then had the luxury to wait. It's a luxury nowadays that we, uh, we, we cease to have. And, um, the, uh, the second uh, ascent uh, and attempt on, on the Matterhorn has been a total success. We, ha we had perfect weather conditions, and we had a great view of, of Matterhorn from the summit. And um, we thought, OK, we are heroes now. We did it. We climbed the mountain. It's going to be an easy uphill down. Everything is under control. But this was not the case. On the way down, a very uh, platy and edgy rock fell on one of our half ropes and cut it in half. So that meant that we had to improvise shorter uphill so that we could get back to the base of the mountain. And that turned out to be very difficult on a very steep mountain. But we didn't lose hope, and we continue to work together as a team with my partner, Aline. And we, even though it took us twice the time it would take us normally, we did reach the base of the mountain. And um, that's when we realized that when you summit, you're only halfway there. And um, realized as well that mountains are great catalysts that can transform individuals into a, into a, into a team. Um, in 2009, um, we organized an expedition to the Caucasus Mountains, uh, just at the border between Russia and Georgia. And the Caucasus Mountains are very beautiful mountains. They are more massive than the Alps. They reach altitudes over 5,000 meters. And they have all these grassy, slow, beautiful flowers. That was really splendid to, my, to our house. And of course, lots of hairy animals. <laughs> and our initial plan, well, we, we, we climbed Elbrus, but that, that was a quite tedious and hard ascent. It was a quite intermediate, long slope. I didn't manage my resources well. I tried to go fast to catch my, my partner, 
My partner was a guy that was born in the mountain village, so he was extremely fit. When I reached the summit, I was extremely tired, and I fell asleep. And I woke up one hour later when the other two of our teammates uh, summited. And on the way down, I kept falling in the snow, and I kept falling asleep. And one of our, um, our friends, Polly, he had, um, he had some really strong chilies from Africa. And he gave them to me. I said, this is candy. Take it. So I took the chilies, a bunch of them. And like, suddenly, my head just like went on fire. And that definitely woke me up. And we, we descended. <laughs> and it, it, was, it was like great news for us. But then we, st we felt quite bold. And we said, OK, we should climb this mountain that was just opposite of Elbrus. And it's called Donguzaru. And it and has a pr particularly interesting story behind it. Apparently, when the Germans attacked uh, Russia and um, this area of, um, of the Caucasus, they saw this seven-shaped uh, uh, glacier. And they bombarded it to transform it into Svastika. So we thought, we looked at this ridge left of it, and we thought that looks quite a good line. So we, we headed over there. And uh, we, were, we, we planned to set two uh, bivouacs. The first part, the first 800 meters of the sand were fairly on, on, dry, on dry rock. And uh, we reach uh, the first bivouac uh, at around uh, 4,000 meters at 1 AM. And this is where we slept um, during the night. It was a beautiful night. We could see the Milky Way and Elbrus uh, in the background. And we looked uh, above us. It was Dunguzarun. But it was a quite sinister atmosphere um, around the mountain. And the next day, we found out why. We kind of uh, felt that something was wrong. And the next day was quite unusually hot for um, for climbing, I guess. And um, at one point, uh, five hours after we started climbing, we left around 6 AM, a huge chunk of this summit cone is detached and fell on the rock face, exploded in millions of pieces, and caused an avalanche that swept the entire face. Fortunately, we were under an overhang where we hide it. We kind of crouched down, and we just watched as avalanche, millions of pieces of ice and snow just fell around us. We opened our eyes a couple of, of minutes later, and we realized that we're still alive. And we, well, we didn't reach the summit because I w another rock fell on one of our half probes. It's something that seems to be repeating. And uh, also the bad weather um, starting the third day. And we thought, these are all odds are against our sense. So we should go down. And you know, you go down, and then you wash yourself and have some good food. And uh, even though we haven't reached the summit and it, it was a failure, that didn't matter that much. What actually mattered was what we've learned from this, from this en endeavor and how we apply for, for in life and you know, for future expeditions. Um, in 2010, I've been invited on a high mountaineering expedition in Tian Shan Mountains to climb uh, Khan Tengri, also known as the Lord of the Spirits. Uh, some of the legends say that Genghis Khan used to come at this mountain and pray before some of his battles. And it's a very technical mountain, and it took us um, three weeks to climb it, uh, mo mostly because we encountered treacherous weather conditions on almost every week which culminated with one week spent in last camp at 6,000 meters, where we were buried every night, and we had to undig the tent every day. And the major problem was that we only had food for uh, four days, so we had to rationalize our food portions to last for eight days. And well, we did that. But it's very important in, this, in these situations to keep your, 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 your attitude positive, your, boost your, your morale. And it, we had these uh, other two people from, uh, from Ireland that were in the same situation with us. And we invited each other in the tent and exchanged ideas and smelled each other's socks. And <laughs> we waited for seven days. And on the seventh day, it was great weather. And we went for the summit, the last 1,000 meters of probably the most technical um, uh, rock and mixed climbing of the whole, um, of the whole ascent. And very important to, uh, we kept our focus on the mountain, even on, on, on this last 1,000 meters, because we were very weak after not eating properly, and it was very cold. It was minus 30 or 35 degrees. So I actually had a couple of, of, of problems with my toes for the next two months, but I'm, I'm all right right now. And then you get the reward, and you reach the summit, and you have an amazing view of, of everything. Um, and of course, on the mountain, there will be various storms, and you will always en encounter difficult mo moments. But what actually matters is how you weather this these difficult uh, situations. Um, so I've realized I've done all these expeditions so far. And I've learned a lot about myself and about my potential and creativity and about my limits. But I haven't done anything that uh, uh, matters for the rest. And we have so many issues on our, on our planet. And I've started studying geoscience at Edinburgh. And I've become very interested in, um, in climate change, which is a very popular topic. Some people think it exists. Some people think it's natural. It is natural. Some of my professors made a comparison. You should imagine climate as a monkey. 
and then you should imagine our influence as a steroid injection, then you get to a very angry uh, gorilla. So that's how you, you should think, I guess, of, of mountain changes. Um, so I've organized this expedition to Peru after also discussing with Simon Yates from Touching the Void. And I tried to combine science with photography and mountaineering. And I realized that one of the best ways to assess whether climate change actually affects uh, the mountains was to assess uh, uh, glacier changes, because glaciers are the first respondents to climate change with changes in temperature. So I acquired a couple of photographs from the German Alp Alpine Club and the Austrian Alpine Clubs, and I tried to reproduce them. And this turned out to be a very difficult challenge, because 73 years ago, there were no GPS coordinates. So we had to look on for them on the maps, talk to people, tell us where these places think they are, and that took quite a lot of time. But we did find a couple of these locations, and as you can see, uh, almost a third of the glaciers have disappeared. Tropical glaciers are the most fast receding uh, glaciers on the planet. And also, you know, as the glaciers melt, the volume of the, of, the, of, the of, of the glacial lakes increases, and it could cause floods that happened in 1941, where the water from this lake, because uh, an avalanche fell from this mountain, Palkara, who caused, caused um, a, a wave, a shock wave that breached the moraine. And, and a surge of meltwater just went down the valley and killed 6,000 meters in Juarez. So great changes. But I guess we are climbers and advent adventurers, so we wanted to explore um, some of the mountains in the area. We were looking around, but we wanted to climb some of them. And we did climb. We started with Arton Serahu, and we later find out that the north side, which is this picture over there, looks very uh, similar with the logo used by Paramount. It's like a fun fact. This is one of the most beautiful ascents we did on Alpamayo. It's a very famous peak in Cordera Blanca. Probably the majority of climbers that go to Peru climb this mountain. But then we tried Yerupaya, and this is the mountain located next to Sila Grande, which is a mountain made famous by Touching the Void, the Simon Yates and Joe Simpson adv um, adventure there. So we tried a steep line on this west face, around 1,000 meters. It was very technical, slightly overhanging uh, ice climb. And we reached a section at 6,200 meters, or marked by a huge um, crevasse that we couldn't cross. And it was because of the unusual afternoon heat, uh, snow started to melt it, and avalanches were rolling down every 10 or 15 minutes on the face. So this was really dangerous conditions for us. So my partner suggested we should upsell in the crevasse and sleep there until the evening when the temperatures drop so that we could try again, maybe when you know, the ice and the snow um, freezes again. So that's what we did, and while we were waiting, in the ice cave for uh, seven or eight hours. We were trying to cook food and stay hydrated. And uh, I looked in my backpack and realized I, I forgot my spoon in the camp. So I had all this food, but I had, no, I had no spoon to eat it with. So I had to improvise some sort of spoon or just eat it with our hands. And this was really a um, shocking um, event for me that really uh, um, changed my life. And then we escaped, of course. We jumped over crevasses. We wanted to get out of here. And we got back to Juarez. And then we've met this guy, Jim Killam, who runs an, an uh, NGO trying to improve the lives of the unprivileged children of the proven Andes. There are, there are families in the Andes that live in the floodplain of rivers, have no electricity and no proper sanitation. And they just, yeah, they, 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 they just consume whatever they find, pretty much. And this guy organized this, um, this NGO. And through the work of volunteers, he's trying to help them. So we spent a couple of of days with them and try to, um, to raise awareness about this amazing action. And uh, this was a, a very big project. And um, <laughs> as every big project, I tried to look at challenges as mountains. And as a climber, you know, I measure a mountain in, in, in rope lengths. And every rope length is made of single, smaller steps. And every huge challenge and every huge project start with the first step. Um, and I've came up, well, I thought, People should know about the global changes that are happening. And even though we have all this satellite imagery and all these like, great papers about uh, landscape changes and so on, I thought images are the most important and, and the most powerful way to express change. So I'm now trying to, to create an online interactive database giving uh, global change and landscape changes to people. So I went to India, to the Himalayas, and we produced more photographs, such as this one of the second largest glacier in, um, in, uh, in the high Himalayas. And well, when you, when you do mountaineering, and this is a very fun fact about it, you get to travel in these amazing places and, re and rediscover cultures and religions and people that you maybe only read or in, in books or see in movies. And 
In India, there was, there was, there was a, an, uh, an especial, a very special place. The majority of people are in, in Ladakh, the area we've been to, which is just in the northernmost section of Kashmir. The majority of people are Buddhist. And we act actually participated in um, uh, a, a Buddhist puja in, one, in a very lost, uh, remote monastery in a Karakorum. And that was a very uh, touching experience. And I felt sort of a spiritual uh, rebirth during this uh, ceremony. And we participated in, in, in various festivals and met very interesting and mysterious people. Mountain, mountain people are very generous. They live in close connection with the mountains. They are totally dependent on what the mountain has to offer to them. And, oops. and they know how to appreciate the life's little things. And maybe something that we now here in the West take, take for granted. But it's, it allowed me to observe these people and rethink of my daily habits and how I see life. And it's, I guess my, one of my key messages is that mountaineering enabled me to rediscover nature. And it was, it was the, the way that was available to me, but there are many other ways. And well, not only rediscovering nature, but also rediscovering yourself within nature. And I guess when you look at your future, uh, it's, uh, it's best to look at your future from the top, because from the top, your vision is clearest and uh, your, your view is unlimited. So you could, you, could cho you could choose your next challenge by what you can see from the top. And I want to end out with, with a quote that really inspired me. All men dream, but not equally. Those who dream by night in the dusty restless of their minds, wake in a day to find that it was vanity. But the dreamers of the day are dangerous men, for they may act their dreams with open eyes. This I did, and this was a call by T.H. Lawrence. Thank you.